Je me suis lancé de rec. Je vais faire un petit clap. When I first heard uh, Donna Lee, it just sounded like a bass player playing any crazy notes he could think of, you know, because I didn't know anything about bebop. Uh, so it just sounded like, like random notes, you know. And Jocko's sound, because I, up to then I had been listening to Stanley Clark, I've been listening to uh, Larry Graham, I've been listening to guys who play with a very bright sound. So to hear, um, to hear Jaco sound, it sounded very dull to me, you know, because I was used to the more bright sound. But the sound grew on me, you know, I kept listening and listening and, and then I began to learn bebop and once I learned Donna Lee, what it w really was, then I could really appreciate Jaco's version of it. So, you know, it took me uh, a few months to understand what he was doing and, but every time I heard it, I appreciated it more, so it really grew on me. I did Portrait of Tracy because uh, they called me uh, to participate in a, um, a tribute album for Jaco, and it was being released in Japan and they said choose a song that you would like to do. And it's very difficult to cover um, a song by Jaco because you know you don't want to um, simply play it the same way. What's the point? You know his records are very clear and very well recorded so there's no use in just trying to recreate it and you'll never do it as well. But at the same time, you don't want to um, change it so much that nobody recognizes what it is and you take away the beauty of what it is. So it's tricky, but I felt like I could do a good job with Portrait of Tracy. So that was that. Um, Teen Town, I've been playing that since um, that Heavy Weather album came out. And I, um, I've been playing with my thumb so much that it was pretty, much, uh, pretty natural for me to play with my thumb. And I was doing a television show with uh, David Sanborn. Uh, David Sanborn had a TV show, a TV special, and Eddie Palmieri, Eddie Palmieri was his guest. And he's playing a piano, a acoustic electric piano, it was very loud. And we had decided to do Teen Town, and I said, man, I can't hear myself. So I began to play it with my thumb. And we got so many letters, people wrote to the TV, to the TV station and said, how is he doing that? That's fantastic. So I thought, oh, people like that. I decided to put that on my, uh, on my album that I was working on. So that's how I got to do it. Teen Town. In your opinion, what is Jacko's musical legacy? What, is, what has he brought to the electric bass for you? Well, I think, um, you know, before Jacko, there weren't that many people who had personality on the bass, on the electric bass. You know, they played it, but you never could recognize a guy just by his sound on the electric bass, except for Stanley Clark. He's the only guy I could really recognize. Everybody else, they just sounded like you had to listen to him for a long time to figure out who they were. So I think he really uh, encouraged future bass players to have personality on the bass, so try to bring out their personality. Um, he, uh, he made it okay for bass players to solo, you know, he made it okay for bass players to use a slightly thinner sound, you know. Um, he really uh, changed things. Um, unfortunately, he was like Billy Cobham, because Billy Cobham did the same thing for drummers. And uh, after Billy Cobham, you found all these drummers, man, on these R&B gigs trying to play like Billy Cobham, and they were losing their job. They were getting fired because uh, it wasn't appropriate for the R&B music. And a lot of bass players, I think, got fired from their jobs as well, using that 
uh, thinner Jaco sound and um, playing all those notes. So I think that uh, uh, he had like a negative influence too with bass players who uh, were saying, hey, that's what I want to do regardless of what situation I'm in. So you have to be careful. <laughs> sound. I think his biggest attribute was his sound, you know. There's a lot of guys who can play as quickly as he can, but his sound was very, uh, is the biggest thing. And then equal to his sound was his ideas, you know. Um, a musician's most valuable asset is his imagination, you know. And Jaco had a tremendous imagination. And that's what separates him from everybody else who tries to sound like him. They have the technique, they have the proper bass, they have everything, but they just don't have anything interesting to play. And this is a problem. You have to study music. So I'll tell guys, you know, he said, I'm a bass player. I said, okay, good. Do you play the piano? And they go, no. I said, well, just so you know, Charlie Mingus, Stanley Clark, Jaco Pastorius, they all play the piano. And they learn harmony. They learn music, not just on the bass. So when they pick up the bass, they know how their instrument fits in with the rest of music, and they have uh, an ability to have more interesting ideas. It's very important. You've written the tribute songs to past figures. How did the great Miles end up with it? Uh, I wrote the song, and I wrote it for Miles to play. I wrote it for Jaco, but I was hoping that Miles would play it. And when I um, brought it to Miles, I didn't know how Miles felt about Jaco, because we never talked really much about him. So he said, Marcus, what's the name of this song? We were already kind of playing it. He said, what's the name of the song? And I said, well, I've got two titles. One is we can call it Mr. Pastorius, or we can call it Rain, simply Rain, because it started off with the sound of water, you know? And he said, no, I think that would be really nice to do that for Jocko. And I was very, very pleased that Miles, uh, you know, wanted to uh, do a, uh, a song that, uh, was a dedication to Jocko as well, so that's how it happened. What do you miss the most? Um, I miss him crashing into my gigs, you know what I mean? Like, I miss him. He used to just show up on my gigs, man, unannounced, and just plug into my amp and turn all the knobs up, man, and just start jamming. You know, he didn't care. He knew, you know, he had free reign with me, so he'd just come in and just go crazy. It was fantastic to hang out with him and talk to him, you know what I mean? And uh, I think that's what I miss the most. Last question. How do you explain the fact that Jaco music still, stu still touches younger, ge younger generation and moves them just the way it moves you when you first hear it? Well, you know, he has a nice combination. You know, he has music that has depth, but he's also, you know, he plays things that catch a young ear. You know what I mean? He plays like harmonics and he plays with distortion. He plays with all these things that a young person will go, oh, that's cool, you know. But after they get initially brought in, then they can start to begin to appreciate the deeper aspects of his music, too. So he had an appeal on every level, and I think that's what makes his music last. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
<laughs> yeah, I was, um, I was in L.A. I was playing with Roberta Flack, who's a fantastic, uh, legendary singer. And I was on the road with her. I was pretty young. I was probably 21 years old. Matter of fact, I was just turning 21. And uh, we came to Los Angeles, and we checked into a hotel. And I went to my room, and I got a call. My phone rang, and I said, hello. And, and it was Jaco. He said, Marcus, I'm in room 219. Come up here and get your lesson. And I laughed, you know, I said, this guy, man, he's crazy. But uh, I got myself up to 219, you know. And I hung out. He was there with his wife. And we were just talking, man. He was very nice. He, he had his bass, and he, he played stuff for me, and I played for him. You know, I was like. He said, yeah, 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 I can do that. I just don't do that, you know. And I said, yeah, I know, I know. You probably could do it. But he showed me exercise for my fingers. You know, he said. <laughs> he showed me a, a whole tone exercise that I still use to practice today. Um, it's very nice, you know, very, um, very cool. And he was always very open to me, man. The last time I saw him uh, was, was before he died, you know, maybe a three months before he died. He wasn't doing so well. He was in uh, the village, the Greenwich Village area in New York. And uh, he was just kind of hanging around, looking kind of homeless, you know. And he invited me to his, his house, which was very small. It was like the size of this area, you know. And, uh, but he said, man, I just want to let you know, man, how much I respect you, man. I think you're a fantastic musician. And um, I was very, uh, very honored that he would say something like that to me, you know. And um, you could tell that he was saying something that he had wanted to say for a long time, you know. And so I very much value that, you know. And like I said, a few months later, he, he died. So that was the last time I saw him. That's the last thing I, that's the last thing I heard from him. So it was very nice. You know. OK. All right. Thank you. OK. Is that cool?